Greetings, fellow gorehounds, and welcome back to Blood Splattered Cinema, where I put the laughter back into slaughter. And this week, we're celebrating the month of love and romance with a film about a bunch of young people getting fucking slaughtered. Wait, what? It's, it, it's May? Well, shit. <laughs> Cocaine is a hell of a drug. My bloody valentine, there's more than one way to lose your heart. Yeah, and it's called cholesterol, and you know what they say. Oh, avocado! Oh. An avocado a day keeps the slashers at bay. Joking aside, My Bloody Valentine isn't as notorious or influential as some of the films I've featured, but that doesn't mean it hasn't touched the lives of many a gorehound. Case in point, during the Grindhouse press tour, Quentin Tarantino listed My Bloody Valentine as possibly his favorite slasher of all time, which is pretty high praise coming from a man who eats and shits cinema like no other. That being said, Said, the version of My Bloody Valentine that most people saw was not the intended cut. In fact, it was quite butchered. You see, when movies like The Burning were hitting American theaters in the early 80s, they brought with them a new level of violence previously regulated to grindhouse cinema. On top of that, big studios got involved because there was a lot of profit to be had, but unfortunately, the MPAA were not too happy about this. And when you coupled that with intense political pressure from certain moral crusaders, especially in wake of John Lennon's assassination, the organization eventually put its foot down and made examples of many a slasher. My Bloody Valentine was one such victim with a good eight or nine minutes removed and barely any blood remaining on screen, which was not only fucking ridiculous but also completely unfair given some of the films they gave leeways to in the years prior. Thankfully, however, this story has a happy ending, as in 2009, Lionsgate released a director-approved recut. It put a lot of the lost footage back in and was done as an obvious promotion for the then-upcoming remake, which just goes to show that sometimes remaking an old film can benefit it in ways you wouldn't normally expect. And that is the version I'll be discussing today, so whip out those Hallmark cards and start pouring your severed hearts out, because this week's maniacal minor massacre is none other than my bloody valentine. <laughs> Our film opens with what I can only describe as George Romero's private porn collection, but thankfully it doesn't take too long for the movie to get straight to the point. You know, after that opening, you might want to consider retitling this My Bloody Booby Valentine. It's sure to be a hit with the kids. We then flash forward to Thursday the 12th, which if you're keeping score means Valentine's Day lands on Saturday the 14th. And in between those dates lies copyright infringement. Alright, I'm gonna have to stop you there, movie. As this is an R-rated movie, we can't allow that many minors in the theater. Man, after my last review, I'm not sure I'm allowed to show this many white guys in blackface. And around here, I'd normally make a snarky remark about how this feels like a Paul Vorheven flick, but in all honesty, it's starting to feel more full-blown David Dakota. Emphasis on blown. Hey, you wish you never came back. Especially now, since Sam's going out with Axel. Let's <laughs> get off my nose. I don't give a damn. I don't fucking care. Date my girlfriend. I like dudes anyway. Yeehaw! Time for a bro down ho down. Seriously, any second now, I half expect them to pan over to the General Lee. And even that wouldn't be as redneck as this Volkswagen pickup. Holy shit. Wait, what does that say? Welcome to Valentine's Bluffs, the little town with the big heart? Oh wow, that shit's so on the nose, I'm surprised it's not covered in snot. That's like if Friday the 13th opened with a sign that said, Welcome to Camp Hackenslash, the small cabins with the high body count. Outside, the town mayor congratulates Mabel, the owner of the local laundromat, on overseeing the town's decorations. So, uh, I guess we kinda got her to blame for all this, huh? My thoughts exactly, Mayor. <laughs> Hi, guy. Uh, sorry, kid. I saw Friday the 13th 3D too, and you, sir, are no Shelly. But if you try hard enough, you might be able to rock the yo-yo. 
It's around here we're informed that TJ is not only the mayor's son, but that he recently failed to make a life out in California. Naturally, saying he's bitter about this is a bit of an understatement. Where you going, son? I always go this time of day. For another beer and a real good nose pick. Remind me of my failures. I don't fucking care. I like sucking balls anyway. I must say, though, it was rather progressive to cast a walrus in a man suit. They don't get much work these days, what with Justin Long stealing all their jobs. Hashtag walrus face. Aquatic racism aside, the mayor takes off with the local sheriff, but not before receiving a mysterious valentine. From the heart comes a warning filled with bloody good cheer. Remember what happened as the 14th draws near. That's nothing. You should see the package I got last week. Uh, uh thanks, Mass Slasher. I sever because I love. Dude, that's gay. Anyway, at the local bar, Axel and the Pringles man reenact one of my favorite scenes from Aliens. Wait, what does that say? Eat me. Well, if you insist. Dude, what are you doing? I'm gonna eat this table if it's the last thing I do. Well, it is an excellent source of fiber. Hmm. Anyway, the bartender goes into nom flashback mode, retelling the tale of Harry Warden. Turns out Harry was a miner who got trapped inside the mines on Valentine's Day, went insane, and a year later killed a whole bunch of people. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a feel-good story, really. You know, this is a bit shallow, but I think part of the reason Harry didn't catch on the same way Freddy or Jason did is partially because of the name. Harry Warden is catchy and all, but it's less intimidating when you realize that it sounds a bit like a Bart Simpson punchline. But enough dated references, because we got ourselves an autopsy to get to. Uh, well, um, uh, hello there, Dr. Me. Nice of you to confirm my time machine works out. Looks like a butcher ripped this thing out. What's going on over in Valentine Bluffs? Irony, my good doctor. Irony is going on over in Valentine Bluffs. I gotta be honest, I never thought I'd watch a movie where Darth Vader stalks grandma. Get away! Get away! Your voice says get away, but your lips clearly say no. Meanwhile, on the set of Brokeback Junkyard, TJ and Axel get their frustrations out with some thinly veiled subtext. What are we gonna do about it? Well, there ain't nothing to do about it. Except each other! Watch out there, movie. If you're not too careful, Crystal Lake Entertainment's gonna take you down and immediately announce their own Valentine's Day slasher. Psst, hey, Sheriff, might want to check the one filled with blood. I don't know, could be a lead. You spin me right dead, baby, right dead, like a victim, baby, dead, 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 dead. This is another sidebar, but one thing I really love about this movie is how it's essentially a working man's horror film. Most horror, especially slashers, feature middle to upper class families or teenagers, but this film gives us a bunch of dudes working in a freaking coal mine. It's a nice change of pace and definitely allows the film to stand out above the crowd, even if it's got a shout out loud. I have to tell you that I love you and I want you back. How was I supposed to know that, Jesse? I honestly didn't think you were ever coming back. Man, is it just me, or is this like a really shitty Hallmark commercial? Hallmark, kill them with kindness. No, no, a pickaxe. Uh-oh, either someone's about to pay for their infidelity, or the movie has yet to fill its jump scare quota. Sarah. <sighs> Newbie. Wait, Chief Newbie? Who's his boss? Mayor Leet Headshot? Uh, watch out there, guys. Here comes Lieutenant Teabag. 
Anyway, the mayor cancels the Valentine's dance, upsetting pretty much the whole town. Back at the bar, the disgruntled miners hatch a secret plan to throw an underground party in the mine, but the bartender does not think that's too great an idea. Gee, I uh, wonder why. Now, come on, Hollis. We got everything we need down there. We got, uh, let's see, we got a, a rec room, we got a pool table, everything. And poisonous gas, flammable air, the ever-present danger of a cave-in. You know what? You're right. That's the perfect place to blast loud music and jump around. Also, I'm not quite sure this is what they mean by a titty bar. Just throwing that one out there. Anyway, later that night, a very drunken bartender sets up a solid practical joke, but commits the cardinal sin of enjoying his work a little too much. Holy shit, a murder so awesome it degraded the film. God, I can't get over how amazing these effects are. It's a goddamn shame the MPAA treats adults like fucking children, because I contend with these scenes intact, it could have been way more than just a cult classic. Oh well. Wait, wait, hold on, it's... Oh, you, you, you gotta be fucking kidding me. In this shot, he's got black lenses, but in this one over here, he doesn't. What the fuck, movie? You know what? I take it all back. This movie's a piece of shit. By the way, this piece of cinematic excrement is brought to you by Pepsi. Pepsi, live for the now. Because if you're in this movie, you'll definitely be dead tomorrow. Speaking of which, I don't think the future's looking too bright for Billy Joe Armstrong here. I predict a boulevard of broken bones. <laughs> You know, this whole time I've been alluding to this film's homoerotic subtext, what with the David Dakota and Brokeback Mountain references, but uh, I think this scene here epitomizes everything I've been implying. I mean, just look at this. A dude is literally drowning in hot dog flavored water. Nightmare on Elm Street 2, step aside, because there's a new queen of Cock Mountain, and its name is My Bloody Valentine. <laughs> I just realized the title of this movie is 100% literal. That's pretty fucking awesome! Back at the party, TJ and Axel finally have it out, successfully completing TJ's arc as a bona fide homewrecker. Our hero, ladies and gentlemen. Look, I'm sorry I didn't mean for that to happen. Oh, shut your mouth. You've been antagonizing Axel this entire movie. You know, when you weren't giving him bedroom eyes, that is. Oh, break a beer, you're the bitterest brew there is. Meanwhile, down in the mineshaft, a really hot couple gets ready for a move I like to call the Miner 69er. Hey, but don't take too long. Eh, don't you worry, lady. I'm pretty sure that guy's a virgin, so this'll be over pretty fast. Man, this gritty reboot of Dig Dug is fucking dark. Not sure if I like it, but on the other hand, at least it'll piss off pretentious gaming journalists. Sad truth is, she really wanted to live, but in the end, it was but a mere pipe dream. Now either the girls convince the guys to take them down the mines, or we're just one severed heart away from Indiana Jones and the Temple of Poon. Also, I'm thoroughly impressed that they're able to drink out of empty beer cans like that. Now that's what I call real acting. Fun fact, this film was shot in the Sydney mines in Nova Scotia, which were fully functional at the time of filming, despite being abandoned. It's actually kind of funny, because while the mines were originally chosen for their rustic appearance, upon arriving on location, the crew discovered that the townspeople had cleaned it all up. So in order to achieve the look they originally wanted, the production poured tons of their budget into restoring the mines to their original dilapidated state. So if you ever wanted to know why film budgets sometimes skyrocket despite appearing relatively cheap to make, that kind of shit's why. Back above ground, the dead bodies are discovered, and the audience is immediately reminded that this was shot way before they could digitally remove things like camera shadow. Don't worry too much about that, though, because it looks like Mario Mario and Luigi Mario are already on the case. Oh, a metaphorical descent into hell. More like a metaphorical descent to my butt crack.
I'll be honest, I'm not paying too close attention to the dialogue here, but based on the body language, I can only assume that Hollis has achieved the ever-coveted two chicks at the same time. Also, is it just me, or are they about to enter H.R. Geiger's workshop? What do you think you're trying to do, you jerk? Easy, I got a hangover. I got a hangover. I got a hangover. <laughs> Is this... Is this what I've been doing this whole time? Spouting terrible puns and causing deep existential pain? Oh god! I'm a monster! Yeah, whatever, I'm over it. Let's do this! TJ informs the Borsum Forsum of the murders, which leads to Hollis splitting off to find the couple screwing in the engine room. Unfortunately for him, however, he arrives just in time to find dramatic irony. <laughs> Blood Splattered Cinema presents Night of the Living Walrus. God damn it, they killed Fink! Now, who's gonna beat the stomach in the hot dog eating contest? I will! <laughs> Meatballs! Oh no. Just you wait, any minute now, Stallone's gonna pop up and scare the daylights out of them. Oh crap, it's Harry Warden. Quick, Blondie, run. Or, you know, carefully hug the wall after he clearly spotted you, but for some reason does not advance. Good staging? <laughs> oh, come on, Harry, you're not even trying to hit him. Oh well, at least TJ is smart enough to pull from the Secret of the Ooze playbook, though I sincerely hope this means we're minutes away from a Super Harry. No, not that kind of Harry, Burt Reynolds looking motherfucker. <laughs> That's right, Harry was Axel all along, and I gotta admit, it's a pretty good reveal, as the movie does a good job juggling the potential killers without making it too obvious. Then again, it really never gave us any indication it was anyone but the real Harry Warden, so, uh, I guess... Poopy Pants? That being said, having Harry Warden himself turn out to be a red herring more than likely killed a bit of this film's franchise potential. It's kind of like Friday Part 5, where there's nothing super wrong with the movie, but you still feel pretty gypped when you find out it was a copycat the whole time. Also, as with a lot of slashers, his true motivations cannot be predicted, because the movie does not give enough information up front. It turns out he saw Harry kill his dad when he was young and was forever scarred by the experience. Experience. So when he saw Valentine's Day was returning to the town, he essentially snapped and history repeated itself. Wait, this film is essentially a remake of its own backstory. Making the Lionsgate film a remake of a remake of a... Oh god, I think I just shit myself. Anyway, to wrap this puppy up, the cave crumbles around Axel, so he cuts off his own arm to escape, or at least I think he cuts off his arm. This mysterious hand here kinda muddles the illusion a bit. Also, you can't fool me, movie. Axel's lips are clearly not moving in this final shot. <laughs> Sarah, be my bloody valentine. <laughs> So, that was my bloody valentine, and I gotta admit, it's one of the better examples of the genre. And I'm not talking about closeted gay romances. On paper, it's got all the right ingredients. A killer with a signature look, a unique stalking location, and at the time, some state-of-the-art gore effects. Even if most of it was cut short due to the MPAA's bullshittery. But beyond that, there's a heart to My Bloody Valentine that pulses through the cliches and bleeds into every aspect of the film. In fact, one of my favorite scenes is actually not a kill at all, but one where the sheriff receives this special valentine. I don't fucking care. Make me cry. I'm a big pussy anyway. 
That being said, stuff like the movie's love triangle is laughable at best, what with all the cheesy romance dialogue and music cues, but if I'm completely honest, I kind of enjoy it for all its goofiness, but for, for most people, your, your mileage may vary. Um, and seriously, Axel and TJ have way more chemistry with each other than with Sarah, and I'm only half joking when I say that. Anyway, my fellow gorehounds, My Bloody Valentine is a must if you're a slasher fan, but can be easily skipped if you're not into the hacking and slashing. Now, if you excuse me, there's a... There's something important I gotta do. Woodsboro... C.A. Perfect. Romance, here I come. Dude, that's gay! This episode was brought to you by these amazing Blood Splattered Patrons. If you'd like to become a patron yourself, click on the Patreon button in the corner and help assist Blood Splattered Cinema get bigger and better. And I'm not just talking about my waistline. See that right there? That's Harry destroying all the ideas left in Hollywood. Once again, thank you, my fellow gorehounds, for tuning in for yet another exciting episode of Blood Splattered Cinema. As per usual, like, comment, subscribe, check out my website, www.bloodsplatteredcinema.com, and be sure to follow me on Facebook and Twitter for early developments on future episodes. And with that said, my fellow gorehounds, I'm gonna go, uh, hopefully not get another episode out this late, because I kinda, I kinda, I kinda, I kinda really blew it with this one, so, uh, my apologies, and, uh, Catch you later, my uh, fellow gorehounds.